As I mentioned, this is a, a favorite text of mine. The entire Gospel of John is just beautifully written, and there's lots of imagery and lots of metaphor and so on. And this imagery about light really speaks to me, I think, because uh, partially because of uh, being a photographer, uh, you know, that uh, the word photography means to write with light. And so it is, uh, it resonates with me. But... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were on vacation, and one of the stops that we made during that vacation was the Redwoods National Park in Northern California. And that experience, I, I think it was the third time that I've been there, and I don't think it would matter how many times you go there. I'm not sure that you would ever get completely used to it. You know, it's, it's kind of an amazing uh, spiritual experience, but as I was going through that forest, as I was taking hikes in that wood, um, this scripture kind of came to mind. And I'll speak more about that later. But one of the things that is evident is the enduring nature of the redwoods, how they stand and how they are so present. Um, a lot of these trees are, you know, 1,200, 1,400, 1,500 years old. They've been there a long time. But one of the things that I kind of like to do is when I get particularly interested in a text, sometimes I'll focus on just a single verse of that text or sometimes even just a single word. And one way to help do this, one way to kind of open up your thinking around that is to find that text that you're really interested in and then read it in several different translations. And if we look at this last verse, there's just verse number five in that prologue to the Gospel of John that I read a few minutes ago, I usually read from the New Revised Standard Version. It's called the, the NRSV. It's my, uh, my translation of choice. But in there, that verse 5 reads, it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And I'm kind of zeroed in on that word overcome. And for me, this creates all kinds of different sorts of images when you think about the word overcome. Somebody can be overcome with exhaustion. You know, they're running a marathon and they just can't finish. Or you can be overcome with illness or with grief or lots of different things. And one of the images for overcome that comes up in my mind is the image of a flash flood. You know, that you can just kind of be trapped somewhere. And I think for me, that's part of that reason is because you, another favorite place for me on planet Earth is uh, Lower Antelope Canyon in northern Arizona. And these slot canyons that are there are formed by flash floods. And tragically, uh, before they put some safety measures in place, there were 11 hikers in Lower Antelope Canyon that were overcome by a flash flood and they all perished in, in that flash flood. So uh, this idea of this, this flood, uh, and maybe if you want to think about it, a, a flood of darkness, you know, comes charging into the light, and yet that flash flood of darkness could not overcome it. So these are the kinds of images that, that I, uh, that, you know, go on in my head when I'm reading these different translations. Now, the King James Version is one that's been around forever and ever, and uh, many of you probably, if you have a Bible at home, you know, chances are good, it's the King James Version. If you look up John 1, 5 in the King James Version, it'll say the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Well, now that's completely different than, you know, the darkness did not overcome it. I mean, you know, overcome has this, this image of kind of some conflict or some violence or, you know, some complete destruction, annihilation. But to not comprehend it is just kind of like you're clueless. You know, it's like, huh, what's, what's happening? But the thing about this exercise when you begin to look at different words is you can find that, you know, they're all correct. 
You can find a connection in every single uh, way that the story is told, every single way that uh, the word is put out there, that you have these multiple truths that exist in the same scripture and in the same word. So when I think about not comprehending something, the first image that jumps into my head is space and the distances involved in space. Now, I don't know if you follow the, the Hubble telescope at all. It's a, a favorite thing of mine. Occasionally, I look it up online, and I see what the Hubble has been up to. And recently, about three or four weeks ago, uh, they posted some new pictures from the Hubble telescope. And this is a photograph called, it's the, of the Lagoon Nebula. Now the Lagoon Nebula, they, it was kind of a surprise discovery for them because they had missed it up until this point and it was surprising that they had missed it because it was so relatively close to the Earth. It's only 3,000 light years away. <clears throat> now, when we talk about not being able to comprehend something, uh, this idea of something being only 300 or 3,000 light years uh, away, uh, we've looked at things that are hundreds of thousands of light years away. But just st stick with me here for a minute. When we think about just one light year, what that really means, uh, if you're not completely up on this, it's okay. Uh, but a light year essentially is the distance that light would travel in one year. Mm. Yeah, okay. Let's comprehend this. Uh, in order to figure that out, you'd have to figure out what the speed of light is. And the speed of light is a little bit over 186,000 miles per second. Uh, that's about seven revolutions around the Earth in round numbers. Uh, seven revolutions around the Earth in one second. So with armed with that information, then you need to figure out how many seconds there are in a year. So you take the 60 seconds in a minute and multiply that times the 60 minutes in an hour and multiply that times the 24 hours in a day and you multiply that times the 365 days in a year and you end up with 31,536,000 seconds in a year. Then all you have to do is multiply the 186,000 miles times the 31.5 million, and that's how many miles light travels in a year. And if you're doing that in your head, good for you. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even want to do it on a calculator. Okay, so that's one light year. The Lagoon Nebula is 3,000 light years from planet Earth, and in space terms, it's considered kind of close. Yeah, it's definitely a light shining in the darkness, and we definitely comprehend it not. You know, the numbers just are too big. And that's kind of what I think is a little bit about what happens to you when you walk into that redwood forest for the first time, too. Even if you've been there before, you just comprehend it not. It's like, how can anything grow to be this big? What holds them up? <laughs> You're hoping that they decide not to fall, right, where you, where you are. How do they grow so tall? It is a situation where you comprehend it not. And this translation of that scripture, of a light shining in the darkness, and the darkness was just clueless. It comprehended it not came into my thoughts. Now I think most of you here, the fact that you are here, tells me that you have some level of comprehension about the impact and the importance of the life and the light of Jesus. But there are many out there who comprehend it not. They don't have any idea about the sheer impact, the, the power of this particular life. And they comprehend it not. But we can help them with that because we can tell them about it. Now, I think we have time for one more. So 
If you uh, have ever seen a Bible labeled the CEV, that's Contemporary English Version, and you'd find this language in other translations as well, but it says in there in John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not put it out. So uh, <laughs> I have to laugh at myself, but you know, not being able to put something out, the, the image that comes into my mind, or weeds, sorry. I mean, <laughs> you know, you spray and you hack and you cut and you mow and you weed eat and you starve and you do everything that you can do and you think you got the upper hand and then you go on vacation for a week and you come back and they're, you know, there they are. You just can't put them out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I like to think too of the Roman Empire. And if you think about this, by every measure, Rome should have been successful when they ex executed Jesus. Rome should have been able to put out the light. They executed the leader. All of the disciples scattered. They fractured the, the following. They fractured the movement. The leader was put to death. And then if anybody decided to get together and try to continue the movement, they persecuted those people and they killed them and they threw them to the lions and they did all kinds of awful things. By every single measure that you can think of, Rome should have been able to put out that light. Snuff it out like a candle. But the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not been able to put it out. And I think that about the Redwoods also. That struggle that took place. We almost put out that light. A staggering 95% of the Redwoods that once were are no longer. They were cut down. They were destroyed. In the wake of greed and the seeking of the accumulation of wealth, 95% of the redwood forest in Northern California and all along the Northwest shore were destroyed. But what has been preserved is amazing. And I find these parallels between the life and the light of Jesus and the redwood forest and the lessons that it can teach us, and the overlap that is there. But you know, the redwoods stand for so much more than just some overlap with Scripture and overlap with the life of Jesus. For me, the redwoods stand for hope, as does the life of Jesus. Because if you think about that, there are so many parallels, so many things that line up because the redwoods and the life of Jesus stand for the hope that good will prevail. The life of Jesus and the redwoods stand with the hope that we will have the ability to learn from our past. We all make mistakes, but we're forgiven for those mistakes and we're given a clean slate and we can start again and we can learn from our past and we can correct what we've done in the past. The life of Jesus and the Redwoods stand for the hope that care for our world, care for creation, and our care for others will also increase. The Redwoods and the life of Jesus stand for the hope that each of us can stand tall. Every single person, regardless of where they came from, regardless of what language they speak, regardless of what color their skin is, whatever they are, whoever they are, they each have the right to stand tall. And we can cling to that hope that we will one day learn that. The life of Jesus and the Redwoods 
stand for the hope that we can all draw strength from what is around us. And that's exactly what the redwoods have done. They've taken the moisture and the soil nutrients and the environment it, that is there along the Pacific coast and they have grown to amazing heights. The life of Jesus and the redwoods stand for the hope that the light will continue to shine. Because the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not been able to put it out. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. All of those things are true, both of the redwood forest and of the life of Jesus. I just want to put a little addendum onto that because I also think that it is true of this church. The hope of this church is that it will continue to be a light shining in the darkness. And the darkness will not put it out. The darkness will not overcome it. And even the darkness will not comprehend some of the things that we can do and what our future holds. So as you might imagine, spending some time in the Redwood Forest, I might have taken a few pictures. Um, wanted to uh, just take an opportunity to share some of those with you. Uh, when I served the church in Denver, I had a good friend. His name was Stephen Bondi. And uh, he had a, a master's degree in uh, classical guitar. And uh, so I got his permission. And uh, he accompanies uh, the soundtrack from this video uh, that we're going to take just a few minutes and look at some of the redwoods.
So when I tried to think about a closing hymn,